For almost 125 years, Britain's invasion of the ancient kingdom of Benin has been presented as a British mission to avenge a native outrage committed against peaceful British officials. However, as we shall see, it was actually the execution of an already approved and pre-planned British military operation which culminated in the greatest incident of colonial looting in Nigeria's history. Although Benin is the Nigerian kingdom with the longest history of interaction with Europeans, by the 1890s it had become a mystery to outsiders. The kingdom's isolation from Europeans increased after Britain captured and exiled a wealthy and powerful Ishekiri chief and middleman in the area named Nana in 1894. The Benins thought they would be next and were apprehensive of contact with Britain. Goods from the Benin Kingdom usually reached Britain by an indirect route through Ishekiri middlemen. However, Benin's king, the Oba, insisted that trade was conditional on them continuing to pay him dash, according to age-old traditions. British officials and the trading companies refused to pay the dash and advised the Ishakiri middlemen to do the same. The Oba accordingly refused to trade with them. In response, British traders of the African Association Limited petitioned officials of the Niger Coast Protectorate to take action against the Oba. Britain considered an invasion of Benin City in the dry season of 1895 but postponed it. By 1897, Britons had visited Benin only twice in the previous five years. Vice Consul Henry Galway visited Benin in 1892 and a Royal Niger Company official named Mr. Taggart visited in 1894. In August 1895, Council General Ralph Moore directed one of his officials, Major William Copeland Crawford, to establish trading relations with the Oba. However, the Oba refused to receive Copeland Crawford because he was observing some traditional ceremonies. Moore advised that in the dry season they should try again to establish trading relations with the Oba and if he refused again, the kingdom should be invaded. In 1895 and 1896, several British army officers, including Copeland Crawford and Lieutenant Arthur Marlin of the Niger Coast Protectorate Force, tried several times to visit Benin, but the Benins turned them back. These attempted visits by British officers carrying weapons alarmed the Oba and his officials, who suspected that Britain planned to give them the same dose of treatment they had already administered to other native chiefs such as Jaja and Nana. Officials of the Niger Coast Protectorate also tried to gather intelligence from locals about Benin City, but very little information was forthcoming. In November 1896, when Ralph Moore was on holiday, the acting Council General James Phillips reported that the Oba had again refused to open his kingdom to trade with Britain, and he requested permission from Moore to depose him. Moore, who had served as a police officer in the Royal Irish Constabulary before going to Nigeria, usually needed little persuasion to use military force, and he approved the request. The military authorities felt that at least 400 soldiers were required for an invasion, but since they could not provide so many troops at the time, Moore postponed the invasion. Yet Phillips was undaunted. He was determined to visit the Oba without an invitation. Without authorization from the Foreign Office, he sent a letter to the Oba saying that he would visit him to discuss opening trade and allowing white men to enter Benin at will. In January 1897, Phillips decided to visit Benin City along with six officers of the Niger Coast Protectorate, namely Major Copeland Crawford, Captain Arland Boisragon, Lieutenant Marlin, Ralph Locke, Kenneth Campbell, Dr. Elliot, Mr. Lyon, and two European traders, Thomas Gordon of the African Association and Harry Powis of Miller Brothers. They were accompanied by servants, a clerk, interpreters, and about 250 carriers, of whom 180 were Jackie, as the British called the Shakiri ethnic group, and 60 so-called crew boys from Liberia. Each white man had three porters to carry his camp bed, food, water, and other luggage. The expedition was also accompanied by the Niger Coast Protectorate Forces drum and fife band. 
When the Oba heard of the impending visit from uninvited guests, he sent a message to tell them that he was unable to receive them at this time, as he was engaged in the sacred annual Agu traditional festival, during which he was not allowed to meet non-Benins and foreigners were not permitted to enter Benin. The Agu ceremonies involved a month-long period of abstinence, spiritual rededication and cleansing. The Oba added that he would be able to see Phillips a month or two later, so long as he was accompanied by only one Ishakiri chief and no other white man. Phillips replied, he regretted he could not wait two months as the king suggested, but he had so much work to do in other parts of the protectorate that he was also obliged to come up now as there were several matters he wished to talk over with the king. Philip's stubborn determination to visit Benin after being told not to do so unnerved the Oba's court and split opinion within it. By declining the offer to visit later without a large entourage, Philip failed the test of good faith that the Oba had set for him and missed an opportunity to show the Oba that he meant no harm. Instead, he triggered memories of recent British visitors who came with weapons. The last British visitor to Benin, MacTaggart of the Royal Niger Company, had arrived with armed soldiers and other British military officers had also attempted uninvited visits accompanied by armed troops. The fact that these visits occurred in the same year as or in the year following Nana's exile probably did little to reassure the Benins. While the Oba and some others counseled that the expedition should not be blocked if they insisted on coming, two senior Benin officials, the Olobosiri, and Iyasiri were convinced that Phillips was leading an invasion force and must be resisted. The Oba also commented that he had heard of white men traveling around and kidnapping native chiefs in an obvious reference to the subterfuge Britain used to capture and exile Jaja and Nana. Chief Dori and the Shakiri chief who was on good terms with the protectorate warned Phillips that continuing with the journey in defiance of the Oba's instruction would result in certain death. However, one of the expedition members later recalled, we thought nothing of his advice or warning. Phillips sent Chief Dore back to the Oba with a message to tell him he was coming anyway. On the night of 3rd to 4th January 1897, another Ishakiri messenger arrived and warned Phillips not to proceed with the expedition and said the Ishakiri were frightened. Phillips dismissed the messenger's concern and told him to prepare accommodation for them at a place he called Guatu. Phillips also recalled that an Ishakiri chief called Dudu Jerry was also full of warnings and forebodings, all of which were laughed at at the time. He declared that Guatu was full of Benin soldiers who wouldn't let us land there and would fire on us if we attempted to do so. When Phillips and the expedition arrived at Ugaton, Three messengers who Captain Boisragon very unflatteringly described as very like monkeys in personal appearance from the Oba met them and said they had been sent to lead them to the Oba. The messengers asked Phillips to delay for two days to give the Oba time to prepare to meet them. Phillips rejected the request and regretted much that he couldn't wait at Guatu for two days as he had been told to do but he had so much work to do elsewhere that he couldn't afford to lose a day and so must start early the next morning. An argument ensued between Phillips and the messengers and they again warned Phillips that it was not a good time to visit the Oba. However, whether he was being superbly brave, stupendously naive, incredibly obtuse or just full of hubris, for the fourth time, Phillips ignored the warnings not to visit a king who had explicitly told him that his presence was not welcome at that time. He pressed ahead anyway. Perhaps the most puzzling question is why Phillips was so insistent on proceeding with the expedition despite all the warnings to postpone or turn back. The reason for the expedition is shrouded in mystery and it is not clear what Phillips was trying to achieve. He did not notify the foreign office before embarking on the trip and did not have prior authorization from it from his superior, Ralph Moore. What was Phyllis up to? Since none of the others on the expedition explained why it was necessary, we may never know the true reason behind it. However, there are two plausible explanations. Protectorate officials were frustrated at the lack of cooperation from Benin and the fact they had little information about it. 
It is possible that Phillips wanted to use the visit as a reconnaissance and intelligence gathering exercise for the armed invasion that had already been approved. Another possible reason is that the visit offered an opportunity to accelerate the invasion. Moore's instructions before going on holiday meant that a Benin refusal to allow the expedition to enter Benin would trigger the invasion of Benin and the overthrow of the Oba. After Phillips ignored all the warnings, Copeland Crawford, Boyce Ragon, and some natives advised Phillips that, as the uniformed drummers from the Niger Coast Protectorate Force might look like an invasion force, they should be dispensed with. Accordingly, Phillips sent the band back, but by this time they had already been seen. The British officers also decided not to openly display their guns and locked them inside their boxes. On 4th January, the expedition continued its journey without the uniformed drummers. Yet, they did not seem to consider that despite their professed friendly intentions, a group of British military officers from the same country that had used force to capture and exile powerful native chiefs nearby who had on four separate occasions ignored messages from the Oba that he could not receive them and who were accompanied by 250 others might be perceived as an invading force rather than a friendly party. This was especially the case in the light of prior attempts to visit Benin City which caused the Oba and his cohort to believe that the British invasion was imminent. As the expedition continued its determined march to Benin, something went very wrong. At 3 p.m. on 4th January 1897, when the expedition was about 25 miles from Benin City, gunshots suddenly rang out from the bush. At first, the British officers assumed it was a gun salute to welcome them. They were stunned when they heard some of their carriers screaming in pain after being cut down by the gunfire. Philip shouted, no revolvers, gentlemen. As Boystragon and Copeland Crawford ran back to try and retrieve their revolvers, they were prevented from doing so when several snipers in the bush started picking off the expedition members one by one. The ambush chased down and killed several porters or took them hostage and killed all British members of the expedition except Boystragon and Locke, who escaped with wounds. They wandered around in the bush for five days until they came across an Ijoman who carried them to safety in his canoe. The ambush and Benin massacre, as the British press reported it, reinforced pre-existing British stereotypes of Benin as a barbarous city of blood. The British accounts presented the ambush as a case of the Oba and the Benin people deliberately luring friendly and peaceful British emissaries into a savage, unprovoked bloodbath. There was no mention of the fact that the visit was a precursor of an already approved armed invasion. Evidence of the warnings that several intermediaries gave to Phillips and his utterly obtuse decision to ignore them and of the fact that he was an uninvited guest were suppressed and did not come to public knowledge until two or three years after the events. A British medical officer who spoke to the survivors later admitted, I have had a talk with Locke and Boystragon and from this conversation I gather it seems that it was rather Phillips' fault that the massacre took place. The members of the expedition all tried to persuade him to give up the idea of going. Even Crawford, who was sort of a daredevil, was against his going up and several of friendly chiefs went down on their knees begging him not to go, as he felt very certain all would be killed. Yet after all this warning, Phillips persisted in attempting to go to Benin. When news of the murders reached the foreign office, Britain assembled the combined naval and land force composed of a naval squadron under Rear Admiral Harry Rawson and Niger Coast Protectorate Force troops under Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hamilton. An advance guard of troops arrived in the Benin countryside in the first week of February 1897. To prepare the way for the invasion force, they cleared roads, built bridges, across waterways, delivered equipment, food and supplies, and scouted Benin's military positions. A combined force of naval marines and soldiers numbering about 700 in total entered Benin City at 2 p.m. on 18th February 1897. Rawson admitted that the number of troops far exceeded what was needed to complete the mission, but they decided to deliver a decisive knockout blow. They also had native scouts who acted as guides. Since the scouts walked in front of their marching columns, they were usually the first ones to be hit by enemy fire. 
one of the scouts was shot in the neck before the force reached Benin. As they advanced, they stopped every few minutes to fire clearing volleys. Burst of machine gun fire into the bush and the road ahead to eliminate any sniper or assailants who may have been hiding in the undergrowth. Despite several of the British officers, including Rawson, suffering from sunstroke, fever, thirst, and insect bites, as well as a smallpox outbreak among the carriers, they captured Benin City with very few casualties. Only three British officers, ten seamen and marines, and four native soldiers were killed or died of sunstroke and thirst. Five British officers, 22 seamen and marines, and 23 African soldiers fighting for Britain were wounded. The Oba and Benin city's residents had fled in terror as the British soldiers approached. Although the city was abandoned by the time they arrived, British officers reported seeing horrendous scenes of blood and sacrifice, with mutilated corpses lying around the city. The medical officer Dr. Roth wrote in his diary, Dead and mutilated bodies seemed to be everywhere. By God, may I never see such sights again. The stench of the decomposing bodies caused nausea among some of the British officers. Although we have only the accounts of British witnesses to rely on, their vivid descriptions and corroboration of each other make it very likely that they encountered a gruesome scene of death. The corpses were a mystery. Who were they and why were they killed? The British accounts portray them as victims of human sacrifice. If this is the case, why were they sacrificed? Was it in a religious ceremony to ward off the British invasion or were they executed as prisoners of war? Since the records do not contain the Benin's explanation of the presence of the corpses, we do not have answers to these questions. If the British account is accepted, then it means that in the middle of a war and invasion by British marines and soldiers, the Benin spent time sacrificing people rather than prioritizing the defense of their land. However, one curious omission from the British accounts may have provided a partial answer to the mystery. The usually meticulous British officers did not calculate or estimate the Benin casualties. As the British forces advanced, they had bombarded Benin with long-range artillery fire and rockets. Rawson's biographer described devastation that the rockets inflicted on Benin and how war rockets soaring sky-high and breaking into terrifying cascade of flames were regarded with awe and dismay. It is possible that at least some of the corpses that British officers saw in Benin City were Benin casualties of the British assaults. On 20th February, two days after the invasion, the British forces started the systematic destruction and looting of Benin City. They burned the house of the Oba's mother and about a hundred other houses. Further destruction to the city occurred when a blaze accidentally broke out the next day and jumped from house to house, even burning the surrounding woods and artworks in Benin. Meanwhile, having fled the city, the Oba and many of his supporters remained fugitives. Convinced of his guilt, British forces sent messages urging him to surrender. As Moore's troops pursued the Oba, they resorted to their family scorched earth tactic of laying waste to the surrounding countryside as a way of pressuring people to turn him in. They destroyed villages that refused to give information on his whereabouts or that were suspected of harboring him. Oba Overami eventually tired of running from place to place to evade capture. On August 3rd, 1897, he surrendered after nearly six months as a fugitive in a procession consisting of drummers, 20 wives, 10 chiefs, and 800 followers, one of whom carried a white flag of surrender. When Overami met acting resident Captain Ropel, the former was dressed regally, bedecked with coral beads across his arms, chest, and legs, and wearing embroidered trousers and white robe. Overami was perturbed by the presence of a large crowd, and he asked whether he could submit in private. Ropel rejected his request and insisted that he submit in front of a crowd of about a thousand people. Overami knelt down on the ground in front of the young Ropel and rubbed his forehead on the ground three times. His chiefs followed his example and did the same. The trial of Oba Overami and his chiefs took place on 1st September 1897. Before the trial started, 
Moore informed the defendants that the trial was about the murder of Phillips and others, and not about their fighting against British forces, since they had the right to resist invasion of their land. Neither the prosecution nor the defendants were represented by lawyers. Strangely, the trial records did not address the identity of or reason for the large number of corpses that British officers found in Benin. When witnesses claimed that men working for four Benin chiefs were responsible for murdering one of the Britons, the four chiefs were arrested. One of them, Obayuana, committed suicide by slitting his own throat from ear to ear after being arrested. His captors hung up and displayed his body in front of the Oba's compound for a day. It seemed there had been a split of opinion within the Oba's court, with some of them wishing to do the British no harm, while others believed that they were an invading force. Several witnesses testified that after Overami heard about Philip's impending visit, he ordered his chiefs not to harm them, cautioned that no blood should be spilled, and reminded them that no white man had ever been killed in Benin City. However, two of his senior officials, Olobusiri and Yasiri, who were convinced that the British expedition was an invasion force, rebelled against the Oba's orders and insisted that the British must be killed. In his defense, Overami testified that he had always been a friend of white men, had exchanged presents with them and had previously allowed them to visit Benin. He also added that his orders were that the British should not be killed. The trial adjourned and on 3rd September 1897, found seven chiefs guilty of murdering members of the Phillips expedition. Moore insisted that since the Benins had killed seven British chiefs, seven Benin chiefs had to die too. The seven sentenced to death included Olobosiri, who was still at large. However, since two of the condemned chiefs had already died in captivity and the third could not be executed since he was still a boy, Moore said he would select more chiefs to make up the full number. He also proposed granting amnesty to anyone who apprehended and brought in Olobosiri, who was Overami's son-in-law. Moore executed the condemned chiefs the next day, deposed Overami, but promised to allocate a few minor villages to him if he could demonstrate his ability to govern. Moore proposed to send Overami and a few of his chiefs to Calabar, Lagos, and the Yoruba areas to see how other lands were governed. He asked Overami and the chiefs to meet him on 9 September to give him their response and their proposal for catching Olobosiri. However, Overami feared that the tour was merely a British ruse to permanently exile him as they had done to Jaja and Nana. He refused to meet Moore on the appointed day. In his response, Moore sent Major Charles Carter and Lieutenant Gabbett with 50 soldiers to bring Overami to him. When Overami became aware of the force of armed men coming for him, he fled into the bush. Moore summoned the other Benin chiefs and told them that if they did not find Overami by 4 p.m. that day, he would shoot every one of them and burn every remaining house in Benin. The threat scared the chiefs enough for one of them, Ojumo, to divulge where Overami was hiding. When Captain Rappel and his soldiers entered the cottage where Overami was hiding, he ran out of the back door, straight into the arms of other members of the search party. The soldiers marched Overami to Moore, who instantly exiled him from Benin for the rest of his life. Overami's 80 wives were separated from him and returned to their families. After failing to regain his liberty by trying to bribe more with 200 punctions of palm oil worth £1,500 and offering to disclose where his 500 ivory tusks were buried, Overami became dejected and refused to eat. He was put on suicide watch. In order to avoid his people seeing him being deported, British troops decided to take him into exile in the early hours of the morning. When troops woke him in the dark at 4 a.m. on 15 September, the terrified Overami began screaming for help. The soldiers gagged him, restrained him with chains and bound him in a hammock before leaving for a ship in the company of 60 soldiers and a magazine gun to thwart any rescue attempts. Overami's sense of terror must have been great since he was unaccustomed to leaving his compound, let alone his city. The ship took him to exile in Calabar. However, Olobosiri was still at large and mounted a guerrilla warfare campaign in the countryside for almost two years. Rather than fight pitched battles against the British troops searching for him, he and his supporters used ambushes to harass them and evade capture. They dug sniper trenches and set ambushes around the village of Ekweme, 
On 23rd April 1897, Olubo Series forces ambushed a Royal Niger Constabulary patrol, killed nine of his members, and wounded another 70. These casualties were more than three times greater than the total incurred during the initial invasion of Benin. The Constabulary patrol withdrew to their base after exhausting their ammunition, and their commander, Lieutenant Fitzgerald, whose cousin, Lieutenant Gabbett, was serving in the Niger Coast Protectorate Force, later died from his wounds. A British Army commander admitted, it is exceedingly annoying to a commander when instead of two or three really decisive engagements, the enemy will not fight but resort to the tactics of sniping and cutting off stragglers. Olobo Series rural insurgency and the casualties he inflicted on the constabulary were sufficiently disruptive for the Royal Niger Company to attempt to negotiate with him. As a result, Ralph Moore submitted a vehement complaint to the Foreign Office about the company's interference. As troops under Major Carter searched for Olobo Siri, they conducted a campaign of destruction in the countryside around Benin City, burning villages they deemed uncooperative, destroying foodstocks and seizing livestock. This court-ed campaign achieved its aim of wearing down the resistance, and some of Olobo Siri's hungry and weary supporters deserted, surrendered to the British troops, and betrayed him by giving away his position. British forces arrested him on 27th May 1899. On 27th June, a trial ratified the death sentence passed on him in absentia two years earlier. He and his supporters were hanged the next day. Olubusiri's descendants continued his martial tradition. His great-grandson, Brigadier Samuel Ogbemudia, enrolled as one of the early members of the Nigeria Post-Independence Army and became governor of Edo State. The most noteworthy incident after the Benin invasion that still generates controversy forms one of the most brazen cases of colonial looting that Britain committed in Africa. After capturing Benin City, the British officers noticed that it was full of spectacular array of carved bronze, ivory and woodworks, insignia and sculptures, some of which were hundreds of years old. Rawson, Moore and the officers took some of them as trophies for themselves. Moore then supervised the looting of the artifacts, which he ordered to be collected at one location. He selected some as gifts for Queen Victoria and Prince of the Wales, and for officials at the Foreign Office. Moore later recalled, I may mention that Her Majesty the Queen was graciously pleased to accept some trophies of the operations sent through Lord Salisbury, and I believe that His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales and the First Lord of the Admiralty also accepted trophies. The British officers did not think they were doing anything wrong. As the victors in the war, they deemed it their right to collect war booty and considered it as harmless as picking up a dropped penny from the streets. While it is not known whether the looting was premeditated, several British officials had prior knowledge of the presence of large quantities of ivory in Benin. One month before the invasion, Lieutenant Colonel Galway wrote to the Foreign Office to advise them that the ivory at Benin City should fully pay the cost of the expedition. Phillips had also sent an identical message to the Foreign Office prior to the ill-fated visits. Rawson was impressed by the artifacts and suggested sending them to the British Museum as they might have historical value. His biographer referred to his finding, casting of wonderful delicacy of detail and some magnificently carved tusk. Six crates containing several hundreds of these artifacts were dispatched to the British Museum. When they arrived, museum officials were stunned by their decorative artistry and the technical expertise required to make them. They could not believe that the Benins, whom they viewed as primitive savages, were capable of creating art with such attention to detail using the same technique as Europe's best sculptors. They instead speculated that an alien race from the North Africa, China or the Mediterranean had taught the Benins how to make the artifacts. Charles Reed of the British Museum was amazed that at the first sight of these remarkable works of art, we were at once outstanding at such unexpected find and puzzles to account for so highly developed an art among a race so entirely barbarous as were the Benin. The British experts did not know that Portuguese traders who had seen the Benin artwork hundreds of years earlier had already corroborated the authenticity. Museum personnel were also intrigued to discover that each artifact was unique, and even when different artifacts looked similar or addressed the same thing, 
there were small design variations to distinguish one from another. The artifacts were not merely ornamental, they served religious purposes and also acted as a historical record of key events and personalities in Benin's history. Their looting constituted a substantial loss of Benin's cultural, intellectual and historical legacy. Rosen declared that he had found a thousand artifacts, but this excluded an unknown number that officers claimed as personal trophies and another unknown quantity that Moore admitted had sold and whose proceeds he credited to protectorate funds. German anthropologists also bought several hundred artifacts. Within a year, the artifacts had been scattered across the globe and ended up in British, German and American museums. The British Museum alone currently holds about 700 or 800 of them, while the Archaeological Museum in Berlin and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York hold approximately 580 and 160 items respectively. Probably at least 2,000 artifacts were looted from Benin, but the exact number is not known nor is it known how many ended up in private collections. The Benin treasures have generated a contemporary controversy, as in recent years, both Benins and many Europeans have called for them to be returned. Almost 120 years after they were looted, the first case of repatriation of the Benin treasures took place in 2014. Mark Walker, a retired Welsh medical doctor, inherited two Benin sculptures from his grandfather, Captain Herbert Walker, who was a member of the British force that invaded Benin. The younger Walker's conscience would not allow him to keep them and in 2014 he travelled to Benin to return them to the reigning Oba who was the great-grandson of Overami. Oba Overami had lived out the remaining 16 years of his life in exile at Calabar until his death in January 1914. The month Nigeria was amalgamated into one country. After his death, the Benin monarchy was restored by his son who took the title of Eweka II naming himself after the original founder of the Benin Kingdom. In November 2019, Cambridge University announced its decision to return a bronze cockerel sculpture to Benin. Whether its repatriation will be followed by many others remains to be seen. <laughs>